like how you said that right before the broadcast started. So no one, no one has to know what you just said. Cool. Wait a second. It was, uh, it was close. It was close. People almost heard you. Um, I do have fresh water in my cup. It, which in your cup? I don't know why, but that's that sounded like you were talking about like a sports cup, keeping you from getting kicked in the balls. That was the first thing. I like to keep fresh water in my cup and my sports cup. It keeps it keeps the balls moisturized and clean. It keeps my boys happy. <laughs> keeps the uh, keeps keeps them cool. Keeps the keeps the crotch rot at bay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. This is Sabu Theater Live. Hello. And uh, we have Miss Annie Ellicott with us, um, my favorite narrator. And also we have Hugo Huesca, not actually going to be able to make it to the stream itself because he went and got himself some food aids last night and it totally screwed up his throat. Um, so he doesn't want to like talk, but he'll be in the chat. He said he's going to be in the chat. I don't see him yet. So far, I think he's just lying. So far, I think he's just going to completely abandon us, and uh, we're not going to have any direction. We're just going to be like looking around like idiots on this stream. And um, yeah, disappointing all of you. That's that's what I think is about to happen. Annie, what are your thoughts? That story checks out. Yeah. That's what authors often do to us is say, oh, yeah, we'll be on Sound Booth Theater Live. Not. <laughs> well, I, I, I. Not after we already start the stream. I hope. Yeah, we got Hugo did us right. You know, we knew going into it. Also, that's a legitimate. Um, that's a legitimate reason, I think, to not want to. Oh, food aids. Yeah. Yeah. Food. Yeah. Food aids. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I yeah, I'm not going to hold that against him. Um, I really wish you would stop referring to random ailments as AIDS. <laughs> I really do. Um, yeah, it's just, it just makes it like as extreme as possible. I think. It, you know, AIDS treatment has come a long, a long way in the last few years. You can actually just live a, a long and normal life with HIV now. Yeah, that's I've I've heard that. It's fucking expensive from what I understand, but it's kind of amazing. Yeah. I agree. That's um like this is why I'm not a doctor. Because I would never be able to You wouldn't even figured that out. But you're really good at voices and you're really good at calling uh offensively trite uh medical conditions AIDS. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm pretty good at that too. Where is, I, I know I have this book. Maybe I, what did I do guys? This is, this is silly. And where is Hugo? Where is he? Hugo! So I guess I have to, I guess I don't have it. I, I just don't have it. I was mistaken. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm fixing it now. So, yep, still waiting for Hugo, by the way. There it is. Okay. Almost there. Two minutes, he says. I don't know how long ago that was that he said that. We're just going to assume it was not two, yet two minutes ago that he said that. Yeah. Oh, Adam K says, I'm never disappointed when I'm listening to you guys. You are fun to listen to. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Hey, I want to see what people are saying. Okay. Um, Let me duplicate this shit. Duplicate the shit. I'm going to duplicate it. <laughs> well? <laughs> hey, 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 let go, let go. 
Sally. Where'd it go? The cursor. Where'd it go? Oh, I see it. Okay, yeah, you can grab the that video and do whatever you want with it. Okay, so I can just keep it here. You can keep it there if you want. Yeah. Cool. Okay, I'm taking the cursor back though. All right, Adam K. Still the last person to say anything. Still no Hugo. Mm. Guys, you guys need to like harass him on Facebook. Be like, what are you doing? You're ruining their show. Well, while he's ruining our show. Um, but, uh, yeah, while he's ruining our show, we should save it. We should, let's save the show, Jeff. Let's, let's save it by talking about Dungeon Lord 2. And what you remember about Dungeon Lord. Abominable creatures. That's three. Oh, fudge. Two but is, that's the one I'm supposed to have that I'm reading the, out of today, right? That's the one that we're reading out of oh, today. God. Yeah. I didn't uh, ruin the show. The second one is Otherworldly Powers. Oh, okay. right, right, right. That's right. the one where you like took over all the female, female roles. Oh, what's up, Barrett Hess? This is okay. So before you answer that, um, did I ask a question? Uh, before, <laughs> no. before you say anything, I'm going to tell Barrett Hess that this is Sound Booth Theater Live, and here we uh, talk with the author of our next production, and we run through a few scenes together live, and uh, work out voices, and just do some exciting stuff to get you guys pumped for the audiobook release. So thanks for joining, Barrett. Hopefully you'll stick around long enough for Hugo to show up. Oh, Matt Farmer has already started reading book three, so he's telling us it's going to be exciting. I haven't read it yet. This is all going to be cold for both of us. So He said interesting. Uh, Trey Bergeron asks, see, this is... This hey, Matt is said how... interesting. He didn't say exciting. Oh, he did. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Already interesting. Thank you, people! Okay, that's very that's very neutral. So we'll um we'll take that with a grain of salt. So this is the way that we're gonna save the show is just by answering people's questions from the chat. I think that's even better than just like trying to figure out something to talk about between the two of us. Yeah. Trey Bergeron asks, how does this series compare to the Dakota Dakota Kraut Dungeon series? Been on the fence about picking up the series on Audible. So um first of all, Dakota Kraut series. I haven't read it, so I don't know how to tell you. Uh, but what I do think, or what I'm imagining from what I've seen of that series and heard people talk about it, is it's more about um, it's more about a dungeon itself. Like there's maybe a crystal that that is the dungeon core, and it talks to people and it's got its own thing going on or maybe some guy like takes control of the dungeon core i don't know it's more about the dungeon itself um whereas dungeon lord is about a dude who is actually like this undead type of character who is put in charge of dungeon building and really all the dungeon building is very tertiary to the to the story like there's some of it there for you to chomp on, but it's really more about the characters and their development and um, the villains and the and the political intrigue and such. So, so yeah, that's that's the from what I understand, that's the major difference. Also, another major difference: Sound Booth Theater produced Dungeon Lord. And they did not produce Dakota Kraut's book. So already we're winning the Dungeon Lord. Also, Matt Kraut. Oh. did acknowledge that it is in fact exciting. So we can go, we can, we can officially run with that statement now. Okay, good. Good. Um, looks like looks like uh Hugo is with us now. Um he says, Hey guys, sorry for being late. So I'm going to be, he's going to be typing in the chat. And Sorry you got sick, again. Hugo. Yeah, me too. Um, so he says, hey guys, sorry for being late. Hugo, 
what should we read from and do we have any new characters to to investigate and now it's like we're waiting for a ouija board mm, we uh, too bad like we can't watch each except other. i don't have to fake spirits yeah <laughs> yeah i downed two aspirins to make sure i'm ready okay cool Aww. thanks for not being dead yet at least i mean because if you were dead then you couldn't do this show He's typing from the other world. <laughs> that, ex that that explains why I get the, the Ouija board feel. Okay, cool. So um, for those of you who didn't know, the first two books are available on Audible already. The third book is available on Kindle. And if you want to check the description below, you'll find a link to that if you're like too impatient to wait for the audiobook version which should be at least being shipped out a month from now. Um, yeah, and we're just waiting for the Ouija board to tell us what chapter, what scene, and what new characters are available. Oh, cool, Matt Farmer. Said he never thought he'd be able to listen to us live because being a truck driver gets in the way. He loves Planet Kill and Super's X-Heroes. Hell yeah. Thanks for listening, man. Those were Yeah. Fun. Those are fun ones. Those are fun ones. <laughs> Crazy shit. All right. We have like 10 Matt, have you have you listened to Gunmeister online? Adult and Uncensored? Yeah, if he if you liked those two. If you liked those, you should definitely listen to Gunmeister. Yeah. I like it. Okay. It's very saucy. I'm, I narrate a lot of really, really fun, like zero gravity sex orgies and stuff. Right. And as opposed to blood orgies. With multi, you know, mo mostly female characters, one male and the rest yeah. girls. <laughs> okay. All right. So <laughs> Hugo says we have like 10 new giant spiders. <laughs> So I hope you guys enjoyed horn enjoy horned spiders. Oh, cool, we man. do. We do, Hugo. Thank you for for adding those. What else what else you got for us? You know I love spiders. She loves them, especially in cluster. Clusters! <laughs> Bring me back in for us. <laughs> All right, just waiting for the Ouija board some more. Meanwhile, you guys, this is gonna be this is gonna be one of those episodes where we're like waiting for a Ouija board, like right on, Matt. Them, you know, like a lot of them. So Matt already read the book. I gotta I gotta narrate another an, another book. Matt's get going through them too fast. I know. I love it. Slow down, Matt. Matt, not really. Keep reading. Keep reading. Um, so yeah, if you guys continue to ask questions in the chat, we will get to them. Oh, okay. Uh, Hugo says we also have Demon Regent Korgoran. He's waiting for Scrivener to load. Sorry. Um, who who's Demon Regent Korgoran? Is this a male or a female? Is that is is that how you pronounce his name? Kor Korgoran. Trey's favorite series so far is Life Reset. I like how, like, I know that you can see the words too, but I just, no, I just like, want to, like to tell you it's the one. It's better. like that. Okay. Yeah. I'll just keep, I'll just keep reading to you then. Good. I'm just in re I'm just in narration mode. I just, anytime I see words and start reading them, they just start coming out of my mouth out loud. Oh my God! She's an ancient giant snake lady. <gasps> Who? Uh, Demon Regent Korgoran. Demon Regent Korgoran is a leader of a sector of the Netherworld. Yes. Ancient snake la lady demon. Giant. Giant. Giant ancient snake demon lady. <laughs> she is excite. I am excite. 
also known as the Lady of Secrets. Mm. You, have be, you have to be quiet while you're doing her lines. <laughs> uh, just got messaged. All right. What else we got in the chat? I keep seeing random pop-ups of my face when it was reacting to something from like five seconds ago, and it's all just really funny. Like it's it's funny to think of my face reacting to what's happening now, the way it was reacting to the thing five seconds ago. It's all it's really random. It doesn't make any sense. Oh boy, what's happening? Is this more okay? All right. So Emily's just talking about uh, our ad data. Oh yeah, how's it going? Eh, we have really good engagement and not very many clicks. It's weird. Huh. Well, we're gonna need to show some more skin. I guess. All right, um, here we go. Here's the second chapter right after the prologue where Ed and his spiders show some some rebels. What's what? All right, a black sea of chitin. Search for a black sea of, oh, actually, sea of chitin. C-H-I-T-I-N. Oh, it's just chapter one. Wait, I think. Yeah, it's just it's just chapter one. Okay. And I'm playing one character. I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, all right. So the end of this one, goosebumps. That kind of thinking scared him. He sounded like an inquisitor. Okay. All right. So let's see. We have... Okay, Kess is in it. Kess. The really rough bird lady. Kess. Yeah. All right. Um. Oh, God. Am I going to have to do a Scottish accent? Maybe. That'd be hot. Let's see. Not for the, not for Kess. Kess is no, not hot. No, Kess is not hot. No, not at all. <laughs> Uh, I mean, somebody's cup of tea. That's sure. You're not older. I'm older. Uh, yes. Lavy. Lavy's here. Lavy. 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 No, no Lavy's la the, the Russian sorceress. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lavy. Lavy. Yes. Lavy. Oh. I am Harry, I'm Harry Potter. Lay, Levy. <laughs> it does not work this way. They say this is number one bullshit. This is number one bullshit. <laughs> oh man, I love that. Okay. All right. So we're ready, guys. We get to start on chapter one. And it's really just, it looks like an action scene with a bunch of, with a bunch of spiders and shit. I'm going to go for a while and then Annie's, Annie's going to be able to join me because Kess and Lavy at least are in this, are in the scene. Chapter one, fall of the rebellion. A black sea of chitin surrounded the grassy hill. Fangs were piercing flesh, waves were crashing against one another, a, con a conflagration of clicking mandibles filled the air with white noise. Iker soaked the grass, pooling into the terrain, dyeing the silver strands of spiderweb that covered the landscape blue. Beyond and around the fighting mass of spiderlings, spider warriors clashed together, trying to run the other through with their horns while doing their best to avoid being speared in turn. Right behind the lines of clashing warriors, the princesses of both sides ordered their troops around the battlefield, trying to outmaneuver the enemy or goad them into making a mistake. In the distance, the, figure, the figures of three spider queens lumbered behind the fight with the protection of their royal guard, looking for the right opportunity to join the fray. 
Dungeon Lord Edward Wright, Master of the Haunt, stepped away from his forces and into the thick of the front lines. At once, enemy spider warriors rushed him, hissing, fangs dripping poison through their clacking mandibles. Ed swung his spear and drew a long arc in front of them, forcing them to stop to avoid their front legs being cut through. From the corner of his eye, Ed saw a horned spider jump at him, legs bent forward and her horn aimed right at his neck. He had been expecting it, as he knew the combat style of spider warriors well. Almost without thinking, he activated his improved reflexes talent and had the world slow down around him. The spider's path through the air became a black, placid lunge. Ed planted both feet in the ground, hefted his lance with both hands above his head, and ran her, th and ran her through midair, driving the spear's tip through the connection between her torso and abdomen, causing blue goo and guts to fly everywhere. Ew! <laughs> Ed gritted his teeth at the added weight. He pushed his knees upward and forced the dying spider skyward, almost as if he were hefting a bleeding flag into the sky. He turned around and used his back to bring the spider crashing down against one of her sisters, who had jumped just an instant after her. The impact rattled Ed's bones and strained his joints, but it was overshadowed by the grim satisfaction he felt at seeing both spiders crumple, as if made from wet paper, their legs twitching as they rolled on the grass. The effect of improved reflexes ended, leaving him with a barely noticeable strain on his body. The vitality potion he drank before the battle was still in effect, which meant he could take a couple risks with his talents. At once, the rest of the horned spiders closed in, their mandibles and horns jabbing and thrusting toward him. Ed wore a breastplate and thick leather armor underneath, courtesy of Undercity's Thieves Guild. Thanks to his pledge of armor, he deflected the few spiders' attacks that managed to reach him as if they had been pulled away by an invisible force. And for each bite and horn thrust, Ed struck at them thrice as fiercely, gritting his teeth as particles of blue goo sprayed across his face. His spear was slick with blood, threatening his hold. His cloak was heavy with mud and gore, and it muffled all sounds coming from him, turning him into a silent killer in the middle of the chaotic battlefield. Three horned spiders came to reinforce the group of five he was dealing with. Before they reached their allies, Ed speared one of the first group straight through her eye, steel breaking chitin with a terrible crunch. The other four rushed at him and he jumped away, trying to pull his spear free, but his grip slipped at the last instant. A sharp spider leg left a long scratch on his chest plate as he activated his reflexes again and jumped back, leaving his spear and reaching for his sword. Alone, Ed was more than a match for these seven horned spiders. Still, he was only a mortal. If they overwhelmed him with their numbers. But of course, he had numbers of his own. That was the whole point of being a dungeon lord. As the spiders rushed him before he had a chance to draw his steel, magical purple crows flew past Ed, crackling as they did. The crows smashed into the spiders' faces, aiming at their eyes, and exploded into a shower of sparks and scorched exoskeletons. In an instant, eyes popped and hair caught fire. Mm -hmm. The spiders screamed in agony and scrambled. Ed drew his sword and dove through the confusion, hacking and slashing his way across the melee in an almost blind rage. More reinforcements flooded in, but now his own horned spiders fought alongside him, strands of web flying over his head in all directions as copies of himself appeared in different spots of the battle, drawing the attention of the rebels away from the real dungeon lord. Ed grinned as one of his copies only a couple steps away was webbed and speared through by the horns of three horned spiders. They hissed in triumph, and then in confusion, as the illusion dissipated into uncountable raindrops. Their confusion didn't last long, though, because the real Ed jumped in and hacked the horn off the nearest spider. He was about to deal the, crit the critter a killing blow when a tough, elvish-looking woman reached his side. She had powerful legs and muscles taut like steel cords. Please! Marshal Kess bellowed, and her sword drew an impossibly accurate arc through the grouped-up horned spiders, striking each of them with equal force before moving on to the next. In a single instant, she had killed almost as many horned spiders as Ed had in the several minutes of the fight. Hey! he called, frowning. I was dealing with those! The former mercenary turned minion snorted. You're covered in sweat, Ed. Time for a breather. The haunt's spiders streamed past them and forced the rebels away. Now that she pointed it out, Ed realized he was soaked. 
One second. Oh, cool. There's there's uh hell chickens that we need to make sounds for. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Hell chickens. I love my job. <laughs> um sorry, just uh catching up on the chat. All right. Now that she pointed it out, Ed realized he was soaked. He studied the front line as the ebb of battle flowed away from him. I can still go for a while longer. Maybe, but your casters are almost out of spells, Kess said. Are you a foot soldier or a general, my lord? Ed clenched his jaw. His blood was running hot in his veins, clamoring for the thrill of battle and victory while his heart raced in his chest, demanding the, demanding the broken corpses of his enemies to be laid on bloody piles at his feet. His temper was getting the better of him again. The kind of attitude, that kind of attitude could get him killed. Very well, he said quietly. Let's go. But if Clovis still won't make a move, I'm coming back. Kess nodded and, without taking her side away from the battle, signaled with her free arm. Nimble feet! Alder called from somewhere far behind them. A frantic flute melody fought the, ba the noise of the battle. The music lifted a weight from Ed's shoulders, making it as if his body weighed nothing at all. Ed and Kess ran back toward four approaching figures headed their way through the allied streams of horned spiders. Six hell chickens, feathers black like night, were bound together by leather straps and ropes. Monster hunter Ka and Yumiya, Yumiya rode the two at the front, and the others were meant for Ed and his friends to use in their ride away from battle. Technically, hell chickens were much more dangerous than horned spider warriors, or at least the haunts strain were. They had more in common with a velociraptor than a real chicken, with claws capable of gutting a human in the blink of an eye, and a beak hard enough to puncture chain mail. Ed and the monster hunters had tried to use the hell chickens in combat for months now, but it was harder than they originally thought. Whoa, excuse me. They were mean sons of bitches, and no matter how much the Kaftar trained them, Kuftar trained them, the creatures were just as likely to attack the haunts minions as they were its enemies. This group was the more amicable of the bunch, was the more amicable of the bunch, which wasn't saying much. Thick sheets covered their beaks and claws, their gazes averted by black squares to keep them from seeing anything that would piss them off, which was pretty much everything. For all that trouble, though, they made for fantastically agile mounts. Ed and Kess climbed on their respective hell chickens using quick, practiced motions while making sure the creatures never saw them at all. Soon enough, Levy and Alder reached them as well and mounted up. Finally! the young man exclaimed. His blonde hair grew wild in all directions, with blue eyes constantly wandering into the clouds. I'm out of spells already. That illusion combo is more magic intensive than I thought. You have a sword, Alder. Kess reminded him. You're decent enough with it, you know. You should use it more. Agreed, Lavy said. She was a pale young woman, wearing clothes more appropriate for a ball than a fight. She had purple eyes that marked her Lothian heritage and messy black hair in dire need of a brush. It's improper for a man to cower like others do in, fight, in the fighting. What? Sorry. It is improper for a man to cower while others do the fighting. I really Lady. thought to that one. <laughs> Lavy! <laughs> Lavy, you were right next to me, Alder pointed out. And you know how to use a sword as well. Maybe, but I'm far more valuable as a spell cast a spellcaster than a mere warrior. They rode away from the thick of the battle into a nearby hill that Ed had chosen days before for that exact purpose. Once there, he steadied his mount. The smell of spider Iker was making it hung was making it hungry, and he had to pull hard at the reins to stop it from charging back onto the battlefield. In response, the creature craned its long, feathered neck and tried to snap at Ed, but the straps clenching its steel-sharp beak stopped it. Easy, eye gouger, Ed said, patting the creature's neck. Next to him, Marshal Kessa of the Haunt stood uneasily on her own mount. Okay, Kessa, 
That's that's Kess. Kess. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. Now that I stopped you from trying to solo the entire rebellion, I'll admit waiting here makes me uneasy too. Catching our breath while our forces fight in front of us, it doesn't feel right. Even if they did even if they had just horned spiders. Her right hand hovered over the sheathed her right hand hovered over the sheathed longsword hanging at her side. Her hand clasped the reins of her mount hard enough to whiten the knuckles of her three remaining fingers. It's all part of the plan, Kess. Uh, said Lavy, head witch of the haunt. She was dressed in she was dressed in a pompous purple dress made for her by the human inhabitants of the haunt. It had brass buttons tightening. It had brass buttons tightening the silk corset, which had been sewed to resemble a spider's web. Her thin cape was of a shiny black, which, combined with her sickly pale complexion, gave her a mystical look she no doubt enhanced on purpose. A collar made of skull-shaped beads hung around her neck. The only mismatching parts of her apparel were her leather riding boots and thick leather gloves, meant to protect her fingers in case the straps around her mount's beak failed to keep it shut. Not that it'd make much of a difference against the huge serrated fangs that the hell chickens sported. If Laurel is to secure the loyalty of the rebellion, we must deal with all the queens at once. She said. No use spending our energy dealing with no use spending our energy dealing with mere warriors. And also you don't expose your neck to all those mandibles before you run out of spells, came the response of the bard Alder Loom, chronicler of the haunt. Oh, old Alder, you were cowering at the rear, Levy repeated. Ed squinted, keeping his eyes on the battlefield. If you must bicker, do it quiet. Do it quietly, you two. I'm trying to pay attention. That earned him a disbelieving snort from Levy. <laughs> No way. You mean to you mean to say you can tell what's going on? It's just spiders as far as the eye can see. Ed turned back to face a very confused witch. You mean you don't know the difference between our spiders and those of the rebellion? Lavy shrugged. They are spiders, Ed, she said simply. There is no difference as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I have to admit, even for me it's hard to follow the course of the battle. Kess admitted. Well, Ed said, let's see. He pointed at a melee between several spider warriors. Look at their midsections. Laurel's brood has gray and black hair over their chitin, and they're usually leaner and smaller than the rest. Queen Perines are sturdier, and their mandibles are fatter. You can see them by our flanks, reinforcing our warrior's charge. The ridges in the abdomen of Queen Bumilia's brood are serrated instead of interconnecting, which makes sense, given they're more aggressive. Those two princesses that are trying to rush the rebel queens are, are Bumelias. Excuse me. He pointed them out. The two princesses were trying to carve a path through the thick of Gloriosa's royal guard with little success, their warriors slowly giving, giving ground to the enemy. They must retreat soon. The rebels will probably try to flood through the gap. Right, Kess said, frowning hard. Laurel should reinforce them before the entire flank collapses. What is Bumilia thinking? Queen Bumilia was nowhere to be seen, the same as Laurel and Perrine. Ed gave her a grin, then went on. Now for the rebels. Queen Cornelia and Queen Gloriosa are young regents. Laurel had killed their mothers during the spring skirmishes. So their brood is still growing. Cornelia's spiders are the ones with the red and brown hairs and the curved horns. Gloriosas are impossible to miss. They're albinos. Finally, there's Queen Clovis. Her brood has emerald eyes. She's the one about to flood Bumelia's flank. Clovis is one tough lady. Older than anyone here. Spider Queen Clovis was the size of a war horse, with mandibles that were strong enough to crush plate armor. Gray scars stood in place of three of her eyes, and the rest of her chitin was covered in deep scratches that were the horned spider equivalent of medals and trophies from past battles. She reminded Ed of Queen Amphorus, Laurel's predecessor. 
While Ed was speaking, the rebel queen Clovis and her royal guard were tearing into Bumelia, Bumelia's princesses, routing their formation into disarray. Clovis attacked from one flank, using the royal guard of Gloriosa as an anvil, pushing the princesses against each other and forcing them to retreat. Clovis's spiders chased them, their mandibles severing legs and their webs catching on their enemies, slowing them down. Clovis herself closed in only when it was obvious there was little risk for herself, but her presence still meant a huge morale increase for the rebellion, since she was now the first queen in the thick of the fighting. As a result, the rebel spiders fought around her, pushing back Laurel's forces. Ed! Kess started, her impassive martial stance faltering at what seemed to be the haunt's first disastrous engagement. Perhaps we ought to drop a few fireballs on them. Get the ranks down, thin the ranks a bit. And risk having them disperse? Ed said, shaking his head. No way. We have them right where we want them. I mean, maybe we shouldn't be so close to the action. Levy called from the rear, sounding nervous. Look at the spiderlings, Ed said, pointing at them. You'll understand. Laurel spiderlings weren't behaving normally. The ebb and flow of black chitin moved with an energy that resembled mercury when compared against the sluggish, honey-like waves of the rebels. Some were jumping in the air like fleas, while others enveloped and overran their counterparts. No, said Levy. I really don't. Spiderlings are even more alike than adult horned spiders. See, spiderlings never retreat from these kinds of battles. If they do, the queens would rather just kill the entire lot and replace them all, Ed explained. Horned spiders didn't care much for the survival of their offspring between larval stage and adulthood. To get past them, the other spiderlings need to kill them all, which almost never happens. There isn't much of a difference in the number of spiderlings or their strength between broods. They're pretty much evenly matched. This is on purpose. A lone spiderling is useless against adult horned spiders, but if they engulf a spider warrior, it usually means a bad time for her. To protect themselves against enemy spiderlings, the broods use their own, which keeps both groups locked for the duration of a battle. Levy shook her head. Okay, but I, so I don't see how that stops us from becoming spider meal in a few minutes. Our spiderlings fell into a couple of barrels of Andrina's agility potion. Ed said, as if responding to his words, but actually reacting to an order given by a nearby princess, the haunt's spiderlings charged as one through the ranks of the rebels, overrunning them in seconds. In normal circumstances, spiderlings were evenly matched, so the extra ranks in agility due to Andrina's brew meant a massive, completely overwhelming advantage. About half of the haunt's numbers forced themselves past the wall of enemy spiderlings, and the remaining half rushed in to keep the rebels from pursuing. Sorry, I have to make sure I know where we're stopping here. Okay, so it looks like... All right, goosebumps. Okay. The spiderlings ran and jumped through the files of warriors, headed straight for Clovis. The queen saw them coming and and ordered a retreat, but suddenly, the retreating warriors from Bumelia's brood weren't running for their lives anymore. They were back in the fray, forcing Clovis's royal guard against her, leaving little space to maneuver. A cluster of Perrine's princesses led a charge against both Clovis and Gloriosa, who was trying to break the sudden resistance from Bumelia's troops. Bumelia's troops. Bumelia. The enhanced... Bumelia. The enhanced spiderlings arrived straight into the midst of the mess and turned the chaotic center of the battlefield into an even more confusing affair. They launched themselves against enemy warriors and princesses and hung there for dear life. Their mandibles were too small to pierce through the adult chitin, but a covered spider couldn't fight as well. They barely could see, and many of them panicked and thrashed about, giving Laurel's forces an opening to run them through with their horns. See? Ed said. It's all under control. If you say so, Livy muttered. Kess placed a hand on Ed's shoulder. Over there! The two rebel queens are rushing in! Seeing Clovis's predicament, Gloriosa and Cornelia were leading an attempt to rescue their de facto leader. Laurel's forces near their charge retreated. The combined might of the three groups of royal guards were too strong, and allowed the queens to reach Clovis. With three queens now on the battlefield and none on the haunt side, the, the tides of battle changed directions. A brave group of spiderlings tried to cover Gloriosa's white face to threaten her eyes, but she took her body like a wet dog and the little critters flew off. But she shook, 
I was like, took her body like a wet, shook her body like a wet dog, and the <laughs> little critters flew off. Finally, finally, Ed said, watching the three furious queens take control of the center. They and their retinues may have been surrounded by Haunt's troops, but this only meant it was a target-rich environment. That's my cue. Kess, do you mind? The marshal blinked, then caught the meaning of Ed's words. She grabbed him from the neck of his leather armor and kept him steady. Thanks, Ed said. Be back in just a minute. Murmurs reach. There came a flash and the stink of sulfur, and his soul left his body, taking the shape of a black cloud. Ed swept above the battlefield. Being a disembodied spirit was an eerie experience. For the duration, all his physical attributes dropped to zero, leaving him only with his mind, spirit, and charm. His eyesight and hearing were replaced by a radar-like sixth sense. Living creatures were bright shapes against the dimmer background of the forest, and a dark expanse with distant stars glimmering in the distance replaced the blue sky. In this form, he felt no exhaustion, nor hunger, nor thirst. There was a metaphysical, faint, inhuman coldness. As a spirit, all his motions came muted. All his emotions came muted, like they were sifted through a cloth, and the sensation of coldness intensified the longer he spent in the form, as did his emotional detachment. Thankfully, it all went back to normal as soon as he was back inside a body, either his or someone else's. He wondered what would happen if he refused to find the body of a minion to possess, or didn't return to his own. Probably nothing good. Somewhere below the bright shapes of the three rebel queens were surrounded by a Somewhere below the bright shapes of the three rebel queens were surrounded What? Somewhere below Oh, somewhere below the bright shapes of the three <laughs> <laughs> It's like somewhere below the bright shapes were <laughs> Somewhere below, the bright shapes of the three rebel queens were surrounded by a tightly knit formation of lights. He descended through the battlefield and went underground. Most of the creatures there were minions of his, directly or indirectly. Once he had selected a suitable body, there came an overpowering sensation of suction, and he shot inside like a leaf captured in a tornado. A blink later, he was a spider warrior with the physical attributes of his new temporary body, he glanced around with his multiple eyes, which were shining with an eldritch green light, showering the cavern in threatening shadows and throwing menacing reflections on the chitin of the spiders that surrounded him. Being a spider was just as hard to explain as trying to describe the color red to a blind man, and Ed had never produced an accurate portrayal, to Alder's disappointment. Walking on eight legs was, un was as natural as walking on two. Eating fleas wasn't delicious, but it wasn't unpleasant either. It was akin to brushing your teeth at night. Producing spiderweb was pleasurable, but in an entirely glandular way. Ah. Uh, oh. Ah. Welcome, Lord Wraith. I don't remember what Laurel sounds like. Uh, I know that we've already been... Like Laurel is more like... Laurel. Ah. Welcome, Lord Wraith. Said like Queen that? Laurel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Said Queen Laurel. She was hunched at the end of the cavern, which was barely enough to contain her bulk, next to her two subordinate queens, Bumelia and Perrine. These two stared at Ed with unbridled fear. Murmur's Reach, the possession spell, was one of the better-known powers of a dungeon lord, and one of the most feared. Queen Laurel, Ed greeted back. Your enemies are right where you want them. Shall we? As a spider, Ed shared the creature's instincts without being bound by them. It was the mental equivalent of moving into a new apartment whose previous owner hadn't yet finished moving out. Said, pre said previous owner was still present, somewhere in the basement, peeping through a doorknob and hoping that Ed wouldn't get her body grievously wounded, or worse, while he was at the helm. The waves of the spider's apprehension flooded him. Don't worry, he sent back. I'm only here for a few seconds. He added an emanation of calmness to his thoughts to better keep the spider at ease. We shall, Laurel said. Have your drones do me the honors, and I promise the battle will be over before you've had the chance to reach it. Ed vaulted, Ed vaulted out of the spider warrior and flew out of the cavern toward the bright spot over a distant hill. His own body. 
This time, the path was straight, as if he was riding an arrow shot straight at his heart, with him having no control over it. He saw his body approach, and then, in a blink, he was himself again. Air rushed into his lungs. While he was away, his brain kept all his base functions going, but coming back in st but coming back in still felt like breaching the surface of a lake after remaining underwater for long enough to black out. The metaphysical cold dissipated. Kess released her grip on his back, and he steadied eye and he steadied eye gouger, careful not to expose any limbs to the angry hell chicken. The ground a few paces away from the three rebel queens collapsed inward, forming a coarse ramp from which a stream of angry horned spiders flowed out, led by Laurel and the other queens, charging straight at the heart of the enemy resistance before Clovis had a chance to react. Laurel clashed against Clovis with the strength of a landslide. Chitin splinters exploded in all directions, legs broke, web flew everywhere, and the queens hissed and roared like angry predators. Steam rose out of open wounds, and then Laurel broke out of Clovis's range, leaving the other queen heavily wounded. Laurel allowed her royal guard to finish the job, which they did with exceptional enthusiasm, first dispatching Clovis's winded guards, Clovis's winded guards, and then beginning the slow process of webbing Clovis into immobility. The rebel queen tried to fight, snapping at the warriors with frothing mandibles and brandishing her horn as if it were a sword. The warriors evaded her attacks, always keeping a safe distance, at distance as they let exhaustion and blood loss take their toll on the massive queen. Around them, Bumili and Perrine repeated that exact scene against their counterparts, while the Haunts clusters finished breaking the rebels' ranks. Spider princesses ran for their lives while covered in agility-enhanced spiderlings, and warriors pursued them with their horns aimed down toward their abdomens. Ed knew if a princess managed to escape, she could morph into a queen with enough resources and time, and eventually rebuild her cluster, so he made sure the eradication was absolute. The battle was won with acceptable losses, for horned spider standards, that is. The forest was awash with bodies and the wounded, and it's no doubt meant of and it, and it did no doubt mean a feast for Hoya's carrion beasts. A few fat black birds already circled the clearing, eagerly awaiting their time to feast. Ed shifted atop his mount, and the sight left a sour taste in his mouth. He was irked that Laurel had made good on her promise and ended the battle so quickly. Experience points were becoming harder and harder to come by the more troops he gained to fight his battles for him. In any case, it was a resounding victory. The rebel queens would join the haunt under Laurel's direction, and the constant fighting for power between the different clusters of Hoya would stop. Technically, by killing a few hundred spiders today, Ed and Laurel had saved thousands. Goosebumps traveled down his back. That kind of thinking scared him. He sounded like an inquisitor. All right, that's the first scene. Nice. Okay. Really so, good downward cadence there at the end, and the yeah. the slow down that was good. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on. Let's see what what did he say? Um, okay, so sorry, my hair keeps getting in my way. What did you say? Uh, hold on, I'm looking for his next link. Oh, here it is. All right. So the next, I think, chapter two is where we're starting next. And before we get started on that, guys, um, should we figure out what hell chickens sound like? Yes. I want to go with your suggestion first. Like, uh, how are you hearing? How are you hearing a hell chicken in your head? I don't know. I mean, I, I need to. Uh, you remember them from the from the second book, right? Not well. Um, there was the the scene like at the very end where Levy had to fight, basically like had to fight the hell chickens, and she like barely got out alive. Yeah, yeah. Did we make hell chicken noises then? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, this is our opportunity. Okay. Oh, you need, uh, more important, he says, you need to figure out what horny hell chickens sound like. 
Okay. okay. And a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> and he also gave a uh, he also gave us a uh, visual aid. Here. Oh, good, good, good. That's what I want. Okay, so let me. Um, here we go. So I'm going. I think I better start. Let me just start with chicken, and then I'll go so I can get warmed up. I'll just try to be a chicken. Okay. So it's like, don't they do this like kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So from there, it'd be like, just make it sound eviler and hornier. So it'd be like, yeah. uh, well, eviler first, and then the horny variation after that. Okay. And here's our visual aid for anyone. Who's curious? Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm digging it. We also, it also needs to be like six feet tall. <laughs> we might have to do that with like a vocoder or some shit. Just, I'll do that and then you just like lower it. Yeah, we'll just drop it like four <laughs> steps. Just drop it four steps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So now my big Buddha eighty eight ninety ninety four. What did he what did he say? I said it's thirty minutes up. Um, it's has turkey. Oh, over. bye, Big Buddha. Okay, so. <laughs> Chewbacca. Okay, so now all we need is just the horny version. So if we can. Pick it up. <laughs> I would love to hear the conversation where you explain what you do at work, <laughs> which is a conversation I'm about to have too um, over the holidays. So <laughs> I'm going back to see the family, and they're going to be very curious as to what I've been doing for the last year of my life. Yeah, so it's, you know, figuring out what horny hell chickens sound like and imitating that. That's that's basically your job. Right? Oh god. <laughs> I I hate watching how 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 often I do this weird like sort of toddler-esque thing that I do with my hair. Just don't just don't look. Don't look. I can't not look. Don't look. Don't look. Okay. So I'm gonna go get some some more liquids. I'll be right back. I will I will impress them with hell chicken sounds. That's a great idea. Nobody's going to be able to one up me. Nope. My brothers are fucked. <laughs> It'd be like, oh, that's cool. You're you're you you talk about semiconductors to Sony clients all day. Guess what? <laughs> Yeah, that's right, motherfucker. <laughs> so, okay, now all we have is left is the horny version just in time. I'm not going to share the horny version with my family. I'm going to spare them that. Unless I drink enough eggnog. And maybe, I, maybe it'll come out spontaneously. Okay, let's see here. Get back into these intro, these scenes here. A black sea of chitin. Nope, that's what we just did. Ed sat at the head of a large. Okay, so we are at chapter 11. Beginning of chapter 11. Okay, last week that he, okay. Big Buddha owns, he owns chickens. And the sound is more, it's lower and, and drawn out. 
That's turkey. The, the tongue is turkey. <laughs> but I want to do the tongue. <laughs> I'm just doing the tongue thing for my own enjoyment. This has nothing to no, do with the chickens. It's it's for the holidays. <laughs> Festive hell. But listen, we're living in a gender, gender fluid time period. Okay, if a chicken wants to sound like a turkey, you can't say shit. Okay, actually, the chicken's gender is not chicken; it's turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, just this chicken turkey. identifies as a turkey. <laughs> okay so chapter 11 Ch chapter 11 oh all right what does he have to say about chapter 11 here uh Just show them the video, they'll understand. Hell chicken, serenade, horny turkey. <laughs> I want to see that video. I cor I uh I did a like a sort of a mating dance kind of thing with a turkey one time at Arizona. Oh really? Yeah, I think David uh James got video of it. I was wearing these red cowboy boots and uh the turkey really liked them. And it came up to me and it started uh, it started doing this little dance and like spreading its feathers out. Uh -huh. And I started like, I kind of took my hands like this and I started like prancing around it and shaking my butt and it started like dancing harder and it was like turning around in circles. And then later on I found out that I was really lucky that that turkey didn't kick my fucking ass. Oh, really? <laughs> Was it like, were you like challenging it? <laughs> what was going on? I don't know. I really don't know. But I did look up turkey mating dance on YouTube after that. And it, it, I believe it was actually doing a mating dance. I think that we were like about to brown chicken, brown cow. Oh, wow. Wow. But it would have hurt, you see, because I'm not a turkey. I mean, I'm not a chicken. I mean... What, how do chickens and turkeys do, do it? I don't even know. Like with each other or? Yeah. Do they do it? I don't, I think they only do it. I, I've never heard of a turkey mating with a chicken. But so how do they I've get heard of, their I've, eggs inseminated with turkey semen? I've heard of stuffing a chicken into a duck and then stuffing the duck into the turkey. But I've never actually heard of a turkey and a chicken Alive. Good luck, Snow Big Buddha. I don't know. I don't they know. lay eggs, and then the turkey puts, and then the turkey does something to the eggs. Oh yeah, I think that yeah, I think that's how it works. The chicken lays the eggs in a nest, and then the turkey just comes and like jizzes on kinky the on the eggs, and that's how the eggs get fertilized. That's so naughty. Yeah. It's, it's... It's pretty pretty naughty. Birds are birds are freaks like that. <clears throat> birds are freaks. All right, so chapter eleven, back on topic. What does the turducken sound like? Is that is that to, is that on topic? Um, <laughs> it, it kind of. You know, it's again, it's festive. What does an angry horny turducken sound like? Hmm. Angry horny turducken. <laughs> This is these these are philosophical questions that I don't have answers to at the moment. All right. All right. So let's let's just stick with what we know, and that's narration. <clears throat> <laughs> nice segue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Ed sat at the head of a large wooden table set under the shade of a gnarly tree. Teapots, mugs, and other utensils were cluttered in front of him, 
Exotic clothes of all shapes and colors covered the chairs, as if their wearers had suddenly vanished and left them behind. The world had a pastel color palette, and the sky, and the sky above was pink with fluffy blue clouds, the texture of cotton candy. A fat caterpillar rested on the other end of the table, smoking from a pipe that left purple rings after each exhalation. Ed looked down and realized he was wearing a blue sundress. Absolutely not, he said, raising an eyebrow. S the sundress's fabric extended and changed shape as if responding to his will, and he was now wearing a patched-up suit a size too big for him, thick black boots, and a gigantic top hat that bobbled above his head like a skyscraper. A shame. a shame, said a floating smile right past his shoulder. Blue suited you better, I'd say. The smile had too many teeth and a hint of a black worm-like tongue. I was wondering when you'd appear, Ed said. He sighed and poured himself some tea from the chinaware. Since he was here, he may as well make himself comfortable. Weren't you supposed to stay away from me? I liked our previous understanding, Heron. No, he doesn't say it properly. Sorry. I liked our previous understanding, Heron. He took a sip of his tea, but was disappointed to find it had no taste despite its appetizing caramel color. The floating smile rippled and waved through the wind, danced past Ed's shoulders, and spiraled to a stop right above the nearest chair. A face white as snow materialized around the smile, followed by the rest of the body. The boatman was a tall fellow, rail-thin, with arms and legs that extended like branches. He had no lips, no nose, and no ears, only a pair of beady black eyes that mocked everything and every one he set his gaze upon. He was wearing a purple coat fashioned out of a fat cat's pelt, with a rabbit scarf knotted around his neck. Don't pretend like you didn't miss me, said Haron. His sing-song tone masked a faint buzzing that came from his throat every time he opened his mouth. Ed reached for his own head, re ready for the splitting ache that accompanied Haron's presence, but it didn't come. I'm not actually here, dear Edward. That's why our agreement still stands. After all, this is only a dream. Haron extended his arms as if making some dramatic revelation. Ed raised his feet. Ed raised his feet and rested them over the table. He forced himself to relax and deny Haron the satisfaction of making him squirm. So you can enter dreams too? Haron smiled, his attire transformed into a black and red striped t-shirt and gloves outfitted with razor-sharp knives. There's no realm too distant for the reach of Murmur's boatman, Edward. He flicked his finger knives in playful menace. Careful! If you die in real life, you may die in the dream. You're spending too much time on Earth, Ed told him. It's rubbing off on you. Well, I could tell you the same about Ivalis. You've gone native, friend Edward. Look at you, all dolled up into a mighty dungeon lord. Fresh out of his first clash with the Inquisition, even. And you almost made it out without a scratch. Impressive. Murmur is pleased with your progress. Haron used one of his blade fingers to clean a dirty fingernail. And when Father Dearest is pleased, so am I. And I don't care, Ed said. After all his encounters with the human-shaped aberration that was Murmur's envoy, Ed had found that the best way to deal with Charon was to force himself into, an al into almost apathy. Otherwise, he risked losing himself into abject terror just by considering the impossibly vast differences in power between a human mortal and the dark demigod. What's, yeah. what's happened back there? Galio's sun wave was out of range, but I blacked out anyway. He shuddered at the memory of the burning pain. Haran switched back into his cat costume. Straight to the point, like always. He served himself some tasteless tea. 
since he lacked lips, he poured the drink straight into his open maw. Ah, let's talk about magic, since your time is oh so valuable. Uh -oh. oh, wait. I was supposed to stop a while ago. Oh, fuck. Oops. Where are the hell chickens? Where are they? I thought there were going to be some hell chickens in this scene. Uh, not, not in this scene. I think it's in the next scene. Hold on. Okay, so we didn't spoil much, so we're fine. My bad, guys. All right. So I think he just wanted us to see Haran one more time. Um, and our next scene starts at, let's see, languishing behind. Okay, that one you're going to have to search for, languishing behind. It, it'll be in chapter 17. I really love doing Haran's voice. Haran, languishing behind. The stone table was a woman half buried. Lang languishing behind the stone table was a woman half buried. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> All Who right. is this woman? I don't know. Okay. Cool. Sounds like I get to uh, play a sexy woman. Yeah. And I get to and I get a glimpse of her breasts. That's cool. Uh, woo, woo. Yeah. Musical voice. Let's see if she if they have. Uh, he has any more directions. has three short scenes meant to showcase some new characters and an old fan favorite tale as old as time agreed no i think i refuse okay mind any tale as old as time song as old as rhyme sociopathic vampire girl is what he's calling her oh but she's hot right yeah okay yeah <clears throat> all right here goes Languishing behind the stone table was a woman half buried in the pile of cushions with her raven black hair cascading over her naked torso like a curtain of night. Even at a distance, Ed could tell she was beautiful beyond description in a way that could draw the breath from a man or make bards fall weeping to their knees. As he approached, she smiled lazily, grabbed a grape the size of an arius, and took a bite in a way that was at the same time enticing and innocent. Ed caught a glimpse of her breasts rising up with every deep breath, and could feel his throat drying, even in a vision. He distrusted her immediately. Even so, there was nowhere else to go, and he strolled almost placidly in the rhythm of a dream until he reached the platform's feet, then he climbed a small series of steps and was face to face with the mysterious woman. Her eyes were ink black, and her irises seemed to swirl as if containing stormy clouds, the implication of thunder only faintly hidden by her full red lips. Ed stopped in front of her, finding himself unable to speak. This didn't worry him. It was just a vision, after all, and one could rarely interact with a dream. He could only wait until his mind got used to the increased magical influx. Then he'd wake up in his room, his shiny new improved spellcasting talent ready to greet him with two spells for his choosing. Lord Wraith. The woman greeted him with a musical voice. At long last. I was wondering for how much longer would my brother keep me from meeting such an enthralling experiment. She bent forward in a way that made Ed glad he didn't have a physical body at the, <clears throat> at the moment, and gestured for him to sit on a small seat in front of her stone table. He did as she asked, still unable to control his movements. Whoops. 
You may address me as Regent Corgigaron. <laughs> okay, I was wrong. This is not the this is not the vampire. Uh, this is the, the snake queen. Oh shit. Okay. <laughs> okay. Corgaron. Corgaron? Yeah. Okay, so maybe we should maybe I should do that voice again. <laughs> Yeah, not tiny sociopathic vampire. Uh, let's try. Um, what do you think? What do you think, Hugo? What kind of voice? Maybe just deeper. Kind of like, kind of like a a less a. Le Maybe like she was doing, but more middle age. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, you know what? I'm Lord, thinking. I'm thinking. Lord, like, um, at it? long last. Uh, how you were doing, Laurel? Maybe, but just like. Um, okay. A little less dramatic. Slower. Yeah. Like Lord Rays. Yeah. At long last. At long last. <laughs> I don't think she wants to give up the game game yet. <laughs> Lord, Lord Race. The woman greeted him with a musical voice. At long last. Like that? Yeah, let's do that. I was wondering for how much longer would my brother keep me from meeting such an enthralling experiment yes okay you may address me start there you may address me as regent corgiron corgiron or my lady of serpents if you prefer secrets fuck my lady of secrets <laughs> serpents serpent secrets or my lady of secrets, if you prefer. Ed stared at her, unable to speak or move. Corgoron made a tall flourish with her hand, as if greeting a crowd, and a deck of golden cards appeared between her fingers out of nowhere. The deck looked heavy and metallic, with sharp edges bolted to a mercurial back that seemed to weave in the very pattern of Corgoron's eyes. With a careless smile, she shuffled the deck several times, making cards fly between her hands, then dance atop the table and jump, disappear, and reappear in Ed's hands, only to return to her grasp a second later. Mm, the Shadow Tarot. Tarot. The Shadow Tarot. She revealed, as she finished her shuffle and set the deck on the center of the table, right between her and Ed. The perfect instrument to woo an ambitious young dungeon lord in the prime of his life. It brings the gift of knowledge, my dear. Of a very secret, guarded kind, too. Of a very secret and guarded kind, too. <clears throat> With a dexterous wave, she spread the deck in a perfect arc across the table. Prophecy. She oh, whispered. prophecy. She whispered. A magic far beyond the kin of mortal diviners, and even beyond most demon legions of the netherworld. But between you and me, Lord Wraith, it's more useful as a bit of dining entertainment between friends, the perfect excuse to get to know each other. You see what I mean? You shall. Oh, you shall see what I mean. She pointed at the cards. Pick six cards, form a triangle with three, and an inverted one with the rest right behind the first. Go on, don't be shy. Wait a minute. Okay, okay, sorry. Ed did as, she, did, Ed did as she asked. He selected his cards after a bit of hesitation, then ordered them in a sort of rhombuses spread. Of, in a sort of rhombuses spread. Rumb I guess that's I guess that's a common card formation. Okay. 
Corgoron smiled and slid the first three cards back to her side of the table. This set represents three possible futures where you fail to achieve your goals, Lord Wraith. Did you do a Mr. Owl three there? Maybe. I think you did. I, that three. Would been, that would have been. But totally, that works for her. It totally works for her. <laughs> <laughs> she turned the cards on their backs to reveal swirling windows with tiny human-shaped drawings coming in and out of the frame. Regardless of what many mortals might believe, the future is not set in stone. It is fluid, like the nightshade's mist seeping through the cracks of stone, or the branches of a river carving new paths through the centuries. The shadow tarot, the shadow tarot, is a tool to understand the present, Lord Wraith, to gaze into the cards and behold the consequences of your actions. Okay, and that's it for that scene. So that's going to be an awesome character for you. I can't wait to get that one recorded. Okay, now comes Jarlin. Jarlin or Jarlin? Jarlin. Okay, cool. Her name is Jarlin, not Jarlin. And... You vampires. Name. What? How is that not a um? Offer, okay, offer of minionship. Crap. Here we go, chapter 13. Yep, you'll just have to search for author or offer of minionship. And that takes you to like the middle of the paragraph where we're starting. Oh, I think I misspelled minion. You know what? Why am I? Why am I even here? There it is. Man, what's going on here? Okay, so we're starting at the vampire's name. Uh, what is it? Jiraz? No. I missed, I, I lost my place. Yaraz, Yara, wait, what? Yarlin. Yarlin. Um, Where'd it go? Yarlin gave a dismissive glance. Hold on. The vampire's name was Yarlin. Where are we starting? I lost my place. We're starting. That's that's the beginning of the paragraph. You Yarlin? Can also, you can also just see. I pulled the, the Google Doc over there. Yarlin gave a... If you just want to use that. Yarlin gave him a dismissive glance. Nope. No. The vampire's name was Yarlin. It's the beginning of... The oh. I got... Oh. You got it? Yes. <clears throat> okay. The vampire's name was Yarlin. She had been Lord Yuraz's right hand for about a year, but at some point before, before that, she'd also served under his grandfather's reign. Alder managed to convince her that she wasn't directly in danger, for now. He told her she had been rescued from the Inquisition by Dungeon Lord Edward Wright, and that an offer of minionship may be on the table if she behaved. That didn't put her at ease, but at least it got her to stop snarling. So, Jar, you're you're, so Yaraz didn't. Oh, so Yaraz didn't survive the raid. 
she said when Alder was done explaining. She flicked a golden lock away from her face. Well, serves him right. Oh, well, serves him right. I told him that leaving the Netherlands, I told him that leaving, leaving the Netherworld for this awful country was a bad idea. I'm not really, I, I don't think I'm there yet with the boys, hold on. So, can so, we Can we go British so, with this one? Maybe. So, your Oz. So, your Oz didn't survive the raid. Well, what do you think serves him right, serves him right. I told him that, I told him that leaving the Netherworlds for this awful country was a bad idea. Like that? I'm liking it. Hugo, how are you feeling? It's a bad idea. Oh, she's from Old Lotia, so maybe some variant of Lavy's accent. Okay. So Yaris didn't survive the raid. Can you stay can you stay high? Didn't survive the raid. Well, serves him right. I told him to leave the Netherworld for this awful country. I told him I told him that leaving the Netherworld for this awful country was a bad idea. Was a bad idea. Okay, so Hugo. It was a bad idea. Hugo's loving that. Okay, excellent. Um, wasn't he like your mate or something? Alder asked, unable to stop himself. Her callousness had taken him by surprise. Yarlin gave him a dismissive glance and scoffed. And? She asked. There was no emotion in those dead eyes, no grief. No regret. Perhaps a hint of rage, but Alder's empathy talent easily let him know that most of that rage was directed at him and Ed, because they were keeping her captive. No, Yuraz was dead, and that meant he was no longer of any use to her, so he may as well never have existed. Alder shut it, shuddered. I don't like her either, Ed told him, but remember why we're doing this. The bard went ahead with his questioning. After all, the faster he got it done with, the faster he'd be able to leave the chamber. It was too cold anyway. Yarlin's memories of the hero's attack were fuzzy. She recalled that the rogue that the rogue had separated from the other heroes and had tried to sneak into Yuraz's throne room while the others dealt with a shock detachment of Naga spellcasters. Yarlin had taken command of Yuraz's personal guard and had ambushed the rogue while he dealt with a trapped section of the dungeon and fought off a bunch of acid slimes. Yarlin had been sure that her ploy had worked. The rogue had been overwhelmed at first, but then the heroic cleric had broken ranks and headed to rescue the rogue while the warrior kept the naga occupied. Yarlin had felt the burning pain of a holy spell striking against her back, and then the rogue's scimitars had flashed across her neck. After that, everything had gone dark. Her heart of mist talent had taken over, instantly turning incorporeal and flying straight back to her coffin. And what about your condition? Alder asked. He gestured at her current size with his free hand, careful not to drop the lens away from his face. <sighs> Sorry. It must have been the fault of those damned inquisitors. Sorry, that was a little much. It must have been the fault of those damned inquisitors. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, it's uh, snarling. It must have been the fault of those damned inquisitors. Yarlin said without a... Yarlin said through a snarl. They cracked my coffin, but must... But it's... Uh, sorry, they cracked my coffin, so mist must have poured out before my body had a chance to re uh, regenerate. I think, can, can you stay just a little bit higher? Yes. Okay. They cracked my coffin, so mist must have poured out before my body had a chance to regenerate. It'll take years before I'm back to normal. By the dark, I swear that when I get my hands on them, I'll drink them dry and then bathe in their... And the bathe in their innards while they still live, while they are still live and writhing. <laughs> okay, let's let's try one more time. But okay, so you went from you went from like basically sounding like Levy to sounding um, like you went higher, but you kind of kept that same. Um, what is it? That same texture. 
that Levy uses. And earlier when you were doing this this girl's voice, yeah. it was like a lighter. Well, that's just because I'm supposed to be growling or snarling right now. So, but but I let me try it again because I'm just snarling when I say the Inquisitors. Maybe I can go back to like a softer thing here. Okay. Uh, they cracked my coffin. They cracked my coffin. So must so mist must have poured out before my body had a chance to regenerate. It'll take years before I'm back to normal. By that dark, I swear that when I get my hands on them, I'll drink them dry and then bathe in their innards while they're still alive and writhing. Yeah, that's better. That's better. I think I think we can pull her accent back just a little bit. And bathe in their innards while they are still alive and writhing. Yeah. While they are still alive and writhing. Alder swallowed. Yeah. It must have been them. Screw those guys. <laughs> the effect of her diminished form only added to her creepiness. Mm -hmm. She lacked even a tiny ounce of a, chi of a child's innocence. She looked exactly like a small animated corpse dressed up with doll's clothes. But her facial expression was adult and cruel, and her lips parted a bit too much over her mouth, as if the skin was too tight to fit her skull. Don't let her intimidate you. Ed told him. She's the one who should be scared. But Alder could feel through their shared connection that Ed was unnerved as well, and he was trying to reassure himself as much as Alder. Ask her about the heroes. In general, I mean. We need to know if she and Yuraz had faced them before. What are they? Uh, just want to make sure we're not going too far. Alder doubted she'd cooperate without first negotiating a minionship pact, but he asked her anyway. The vampire's golden eyebrows rose an inch. Then she chuckled mirthlessly. Alder noted the way her eyes turned distant, calculating. Using his empathy talent to read her emptiness was almost as telling as if there had been something there the fir as if there had been something there the first place. Um Who's saying this? Oh, okay, that's her. I know who you are. I know. I know who you are, she, she said. She said at last. Lord Wraith, is it not? Oh, the netherworld is hot with gossip about you. You are loneness. The first, oh, the first otherworldly dungeon lord. Summoning you was a move stolen. Straight from the Light's playbook. Summoning you was a move stolen straight from the Light's playbook. Some think it's a shameful display of desperation to bring a stranger to deal with our problems. They'd rather to go back whence you they'd rather you to go back whence you came. I'm not sure myself. She narrowed her eyes to slits. How did you survive here? When Yara's when Yiraz came, uh, when Yiraz and I came to Starevos, we tried to contact you, forge an alliance. Yet you refused to answer. Why? Because you're murderous lunatics, Ed thought. <laughs> We're the ones asking the questions, Alder said. I was more than twice your age before I became a vampire, Yarlin told Alder. I know all the tricks, kid. I want, I want proof that you won't destroy me afterward. I want a pact. Ed had already discussed with him what to say if she asked for a pact. Best I can do is a temporal offer, Alder said. We shall speak the, the truth to each other, and will respect the spirit of the pact as well as the, as well as the letter. For the duration, we won't harm you, and you won't harm us. No escape attempts either. The vampire's face was a gray mask. Again, Alder detected no emotions other than the constant undercurrent of anger. He had the eerie sensation that his empathy had misread her the first time around. She was angry because he was warm and alive, and she was cold and dead, and she wanted to take what he had and drink it all into her. I see, she intoned. Interesting author. 
she shuffled closer to the lines of the magical circle. But then again, why bother with all this weariness, Lord Wraith? As creatures of the dark, we are kindred spirits. We should be taking us we should be talking as equals, eager to join forces against the militant church. Just have your ve- just have your vessel break this flimsy circle. Step over its step over its boundary, my darling, and we can have ourselves a merry chat. An enticing pale purple light shone out of her eyes as she spoke that last sentence. Alder could see the beam through the dirty lens. Its light was diffused, filtered somewhat by the enchantments in the glass, but the bard could now see how shoddy its craftsmanship had been. The magic unraveled as Yarlan's magic punched through with ease to Alder's horror. Yarlan's words seemed coated in honey as they reached his ears. They echoed inside his head, warm and lovely like the lullabies his mother sang to him when he was a baby in the cradle. <clears throat> Alder? Nothing in the world would be more lovely than following Yarlan's gentle suggestion. And she was right anyway. Why would they distrust a potential ally as powerful as her? She could do so much for the haunt. If only they showed her the tiniest bit of confidence... Alder, don't listen to her. Alder took a step toward the circle. Yarlan's eyes widened with anticipation, a smirk drawing on her face as her hands extended to embrace him warmly as soon as he was over the boundary. And he was almost there, his feet hovering an inch behind the limit of the circle, with all his weight set to finish that step and he was yanked out of his body by a black roaring cloud inside his head, violently shoved into some backward basement inside his own mind. As soon as he'd lost control of his body, his common sense had returned, as fast as he'd hit the basement's, basement's floorboards. He was horrified with himself and at what had been about to happen. He watched, to, he watched through two distant holes of light, almost in slow motion, as his leg passed the boundary of his magical circle, of the magical circle carried by his own body's forward momentum. What he'd thought of as a small step had been practically a leap. Alder saw how the little undead monster hissed with pleasure and hunger and flung herself at the dungeon lord. At Alder, as fast as a blink, her claws aimed straight at his eyes. Alder screamed as the shadow of the vampire covered his face and that's it those are no hell chickens no hell chickens i know um let's see yeah he didn't add an, an extra hell oh. scene but that's okay we did work out the hell chicken voices a little bit and um can i get rid of this box yeah go ahead get rid of that shit there we go. Now I can see the conversation. Um, I have a short scene with hell chickens. You want to use that one? Slight spoilers. That's what he says. Yes. No. Thank you, Matthew. Okay. I think I think actually you know we've been doing, we've been going for an hour and a half. Yeah. We'll, we'll let the we'll let the hell chickens be a surprise for when you guys listen to the audiobook. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming and hanging out with us. Sorry about um, the little hiccup at the beginning, but Hugo showed up. He got us uh, He got us set straight with some good scenes. Um, I'm really excited for these new characters for Annie to play with. Me too. These are going to be such good ones. I love the characters that I get to play for Hugo. Yes. Um, Thanks, uh, Adam, and thank you, Matthew. And, yeah, something to look forward to for sure. Sinna? Sin am I saying that right? Sinna 454? Let me see. Sinna. Maybe? Sina? Sinna. Fina? Um, Fina? <laughs> Is there anyone Fina? Um, so, yes. Uh, thank you, Hugo, for coming and hanging out with us and uh, giving us some directions and writing us these amazing characters. Sinna, um, I'm just going to call you Sinna until you correct me. Okay, excellent. <laughs> Um, thank you, Annie, for coming in and being excellent monsters for us. Thank and you, Jeff. 
being for here. having this lovely program. And uh, thank you for being a hell chicken for a little bit. I'm giving, I am giving much thanks for the opportunity to be a hell chicken <laughs> this Thanksgiving. Yes, good, good. It's a very festive creature to be. And um, yeah, guys, so keep an eye out. Again, check the description below if you want to pick up the, um, the Kindle edition of this book before uh, the audio comes out. And if you are a first timer here at Soundboo Theater Live, be sure to like and bye, and Matthew. Bye, Adam. Bye, guys. Um, be sure to like and subscribe this video, like this video, and subscribe to our channel. Um, also, in the description are a bunch of links to different Facebook groups that we hang out in. And yeah, that's it for tonight. So thank you guys again, and I will see you on our next Soundboo Theater Live, which will be Sunday or tonight. There's a drinking with Charles. I almost forgot. There's a drinking with Charles. Charles Dean and I will be drinking with Mr. Jeffrey Falcon Logue, the author of the Slime Dungeon Chronicles. And Jeffrey Falcon Logue is designing a video game for which I have done all the sound effects effects for the upcoming demo. Uh, the demo Hi, is, is going to be played tonight on the Drinking with Charles stream at 8:30 p.m. Central, 9:30 p.m. Eastern. So come hang out with us. Bring the alcohol. We're bringing our own. We would share with you. We really would. Um, but that is impossible because of physics. So be there for that. And that's on this channel. So subscribe. Later. Later.